Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I would like to talk about um, magnetic induction, continue to talk about magnetic induction. In this case, um, we will talk about self-induction. It's a very important topic, actually, especially for practical implications. Now, this lecture is part of the course Physics for Team presented on Unizor.com. Um, by the way, this course has a prerequisite on the same website, it's called Mass for Teens, and I do consider Mass to be really a very, very important for physics course, because there are lots and lots of Mass in, er in, in everything we're, we're talking about, especially vector algebra, algebra and, uh, and calculus. Um, so, um, let's talk about induction. Um, let's consider a very simple experiment which we were actually doing before. We were talking about didn't do any experiments. We talk about experiments. So let's say you have a loop, wire loop. So you have a source of um, electricity, a battery. So there is a direct current in it. Okay. Now, let's assume that our direct current is changing. Now, why it can change? Well, for, for example, if you have something like a resistor here in this circuit, and you are changing, it's a, it's a resistor which can actually change its own resistance, um, then, obviously, since you have certain primary source of voltage uh, and you have certain resistance here R which is a function of time you're changing it so that's why your primary current using the Ohm's law would change, right? Well, right, but not exactly now Another example is when you have a switch here. And that's what actually uh, makes make some practical implication. So if you have a switch here, and you are turning the electricity on, basically. Like, for instance, you have a lamp and you just turn the switch on to turn the lamp on. What happens? Well, in this particular case, right now, if the switch is off, you have absolutely no electric current, right? So you can consider that the resistance of this is equal to, well, infinity, almost infinity. Now, when it's closed, when you s your switch is on, uh, obviously you expect that you have certain current. Now, switch is turning on and off not instantaneously. There is certain very small um, uh, uh, period of time during which this switch is uh, first it just touches the, the, the contact then it goes really firmly onto the contact. So there is a tiny interval of time during which your um, electric current in this loop should grow from zero to some substantial um, value, whatever, whatever the value is supposed to be. So, there is a growth from zero to certain maximum. It doesn't grow in, in, in just the jump. Things in, in, in nature doesn't, don't really jump. They really do things uh, slowly with whatever the pace is. In this case, pace is very fast, but it's still not, not a jump from zero to max. So, there is a change of um, current. In some way it happens, whether it's a switch or a resistor of changing resistance, etc. And that's what's very important to basically analyze, what's happening in this particular case. Now, we do know that whenever you have direct current in a loop, let's say it's a circular loop for simplicity. Now, what happens is, around this there is a magnetic field you know 
around every um, wire, if there is a direct current around it, you have magnetic uh, field generated by moving electrons, right? Now, in this case, happens exactly the same thing. So you have magnetic field around this. So it goes through the wire loop and then comes around and that's how magnetic lines are arranged. So in the, in the center uh, of this loop direction of all magnetic lines uh, is well, perpendicular to the board, right? And we actually did some calculations and we have determined the uh, um, intensity of the magnetic field as being equal to mu i divided by uh, 2r, where r is the radius of the loop. So, in a different lecture um, dedicated to um, magnetic field generated by direct current, in this case current in a loop, we did derive this formula for a center. Now, if it's not a center, it's something else, you will still have proportionality to i. Now, why? For a very simple reason, because basically like every electron creates by its moving certain field. So, i is a measure of um, basically a number of electrons per uh, unit of time which travels through this wire. So it's additive function. That's why you increase, you double number of electrons, you double the intensity of the field. So at every point in this particular loop, uh, intensity of the magnetic field would be proportional. Now this is the formula for a center. Not in the center, it would be some other parameters like how far from a center you are located and stuff like this. A little bit more complicated formula. But doesn't matter. What matter is it's proportional to I. Okay, that's the second observation. So the first is that we have the magnetic field. The second one is it's changing. If I is changing, if I is a function of time, then intensity is a function of time. Okay. Now, in a, uh, one of the previous lectures, we have um, learned about the Faraday's law. Now, Faraday's law basically is related to induced electricity. Uh, you remember when the frame is um, rotating in the magnetic field, it generates magnetic field because of its changing generates electricity inside. So what happens is magnetic flux which goes through the frame is changing and that's what actually generates the um, electromotive force and uh, additional current in, s in, in this uh, wire frame. Okay, so what's important is magnetic flux. But look, if my intensity of the field is changing, my loop stay, st stays as it is. So magnetic flux is basically amount of magnetic intensity going through this um, uh, through the area of this loop, right? So at any point, flux differential of flux is equal to b times differential of area, so somewhere here. For instance, this is my little area, differential of the, uh, of the area. There is some magnetic flux here, which is proportional to uh, changing, changing electric current. So you have certain amount of flux. So that's why flux is also, the whole flux is some of these. And again, every one of these is proportional to I. So the whole flux as a function of t, would be proportional to i.
But now what's happening? The flux generates electricity if it's changing, right? Remember the Faraday's law? The electricity generated, this is electric, um, uh, electromotive force basically, EMF, is it's actually equal to a rate of change. Now, let me put absolute value here. So we're not talking about science right now. But anyway, whenever my flux, which magnetic flux, which goes through this loop, uh, is changing, it generates electromotive force. Now, this electromotive force, I should say it's a secondary one. See, this is the primary. It exists by itself. But because I have changed the resistance of this loop by switching the, some kind of a switch on and off or changing the resistance using rail stat or whatever, we are changing the current. Now, since we are changing the current, we are changing the uh, in intensity of the magnetic field at any point inside the loop, changing the magnetic field intensity results in changing of my uh, magnetic flux which goes through this loop and changing of magnetic flux causing generation of secondary EMF, secondary electromotive force. And that's what's very important and that's what actually self-induction means. We are generating additional electromotive force by changing the current in this circuit. Now, obviously we understand that the uh, circular uh, loop in this case, it doesn't really matter what, what's the shape of it. It's just different calculations of dependency of um, magnetic, uh, magnetic field intensity at every point inside the loop, inside the circuit. Uh, but whatever it is, it's still proportional to I, and since it's proportional to I, if we are changing uh, the electric current, the uh, magnetic field intensity is changing and from magnetic field intensity my flux will be changing again proportional to change to I and that's why we have generation of the secondary induced EMF, induced electromagnetic force. So there is a primary one which is here and there is an induced one. Now what does it mean that we generate induced electromotive uh, force well it means we are actually adding we have two different electromotive force and each one of them contributes or results in certain electric current so this one also generates certain electric current inside the loop so there is a secondary this is primary and this is secondary also the banking continue and now my total current in the loop will be some of these. Let's check the signs. For instance, we are increasing um, my um, current. So whenever we are switching on, for instance, or we are reducing the re resistance of rail step, which is uh, part of this circuit. So what happens if we are increasing IP, primary? Um, now, whenever we are increasing primary um, current, my primary um, intensity is increasing, my flux is increasing, and derivative is positive, right? When the function is increasing, you remember from calculus, its uh, derivative is positive. Okay, now derivative is positive. Let's just think about this one. If this one, if this generated electromotive force generates it in such a way that this sign of this secondary uh, electric current is exactly the same as sign of the primary, we are increasing our uh, electric current even more right so increasing of the primary if 
Now this thing is positive. Okay. So if we are increasing primary current, my flux is positive, my, my derivative of the flux by time, rate of change of flux is positive. Now, if this is also positive and correspondingly my um, current is positive, adding to this one, it would probably be growing even faster, right? So I primary is growing, but we are adding something, which means it's growing even faster during the same amount of time. Now, the faster grows, now my intensity would grow even faster. That's the secondary intensity, because the primary intensity is produced by primary uh, current, secondary intensity produced by additional secondary intensity. Now, if it has the same sign as the primary, my total intensity would be even greater. My flux will be even greater, so it grows faster. If it grows faster, my derivative would be greater. You remember? The, it, it, the, the derivative is basically uh, um, a rate of growth. And we will generate even more. And that would generate even more current, secondary current. It would add up into the primary, etc., etc. It looks like we will very easily grow to um, uh, in infinite amount of electricity produced right from basically nothing. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the law of conservation of energy doesn't allow us to do this. So, from this you can just logically derive um, the conclusion that this should be uh, opposite sign. So, whenever my um, uh, current is increasing, primary current is increasing, my total current should decrease. Otherwise, we would have infinite amount of energy. So that's why I put this minus when generated um, the uh, secondary um, EMF. Okay, now what happens if we are decreasing the current? Okay, if we are decreasing the current, our um, intensity is decreasing, our flux is in, uh, de decreasing, our um, flux uh, flux is decreasing and that's why its um, derivative, the rate of change, is negative, right? When the function is decreasing, rate of change is n negative. Now, if we are changing the sign of this, obviously the generated electricity would change the sign, generated a EMF, induced EMF, secondary one, would also change the sign, right? So, in this particular case, um, if increasing gives us the current which goes against, then decreasing, since we're changing the sign, should really increase. And that's actually what's happening. So whenever you are decreasing the primary current, the secondary current uh, would, work, would work opposite to it, which means it will try to increase it. So it will be. So if this one goes down, uh, this one would would help you. It would add something into the current. More electrons will go. So in both cases, this minus sign is is valid. Whenever you are increasing the current, the induced current would be working against it. Whenever you're decreasing the primary current, the induced one, the secondary current, would try to support it. It would add something into the current. And that's what's very important for practical um, uh, application. You see, whenever you're switching something on and off, since during a very, very short time, we have a significant change in the current, either from zero to some value, or if we are switching off from zero down to, uh, from, from something down to zero. Now, since the time is very short, my flux is changing 
from whatever the value is, let's let's talk about the decreasing, so it will go down to zero during a very, very short amount of time. Well, which means that the rate of change is great. It doesn't really matter how big it was in the beginning, but since we are changing the time during which it goes down to zero, if this time is significantly small, my rate, my first derivative by time, would be really large. Which means that whenever you are switching off uh, electricity from, from, from the circuit, if this switching off is really instantaneous, we should expect the secondary uh, current to grow very, very fast and very significantly. That's why it's very dangerous, especially for high voltage uh, circuits, to um, abruptly uh, switch, it, sw switch the whole thing off and on as well, because we will have these um, plus, or neg uh, plus or minus positive and negative flows of electricity if the time is of switching on and off is very short, then these secondary currents might be really, really significant. And they might actually blow some fuses or do something else. That's why it's recommended, especially again in high voltage circuits, to switch them off using some rheostat, which means it's a device which will either increase or decrease the resistance gradually during a certain amount of time, not instantaneously. Because again, there is no such thing as, as instantaneous in nature, it's still a very short amount of time, and we don't want the derivative to be very fast, uh, function to be very fast growing, the flux. So, now, the situation is actually much more complex, because whenever we are adding something or subtracting something from the current, we are adding more change. So we are adding more change, which means it's also should be involved in this. So now it should be primary plus, plus secondary. But that will be the tertiary, uh, etc. So it really grows. The only thing is, every next uh, piece of that thing is smaller than the previous one. So we usually are ending on a secondary one. But in theory, it's a very complicated process which happens in the circuit whenever you're switching it on or off. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, so, why don't you just take a look at uh, the unisor.com. This particular lecture has notes, as every, other, uh, as every other lecture. It has very detailed notes, which can be used basically like a textbook. And then there are some problems which are solved, there are exams for people, so I do recommend you to take the whole course on unisor.com. That's for those who just found this lecture by accident or by searching the YouTube channel or something like that. The website is much more comprehensive and it also has very important functionality. Okay, thanks very much. That's it for today and good luck.